in het BBC Philharmonic Orchestra, James McMillan, in huis haalde als dirigent en componist, hadden ze iemand die al snel naam zou maken. En inderdaad, ondertussen worden zijn composities op alle internationale podia uitgevoerd. Hij raakte bevriend met de cellist Rostropovic en de aartsbisschop van Canterbury, Rowan Williams, werkte mee aan een muzikaal drama van hem. Maar deze onvermoeibare schot raakte ook bekend door enkele controversiële uitspraken. En wij zochten hem op in Londen. Your career started internationally after the London Proms in 1990. Can you tell something about that? Um, yes, I, I wrote a, an orchestral piece called The Confession of Isabel Gaudi, um, which was, uh, had its premiere at the London Proms in 1990. And it, it seemed to be uh, the moment where um, I think a lot of people who are interested in contemporary music noticed what I was doing. And so it, it proved to be a very uh, important piece for me and an important event to have it launched at such a, a public, mm -hmm. uh, in, in such a public way on the television and the radio and so on. So what was it about? Well, well, the question is, is music about anything? I suppose that's a, a deeply philosophical question, mm -hmm. but uh, nevertheless, composers can be uh, inspired by sometimes the strangest things to write their music. And I wouldn't say this was a piece of program music, but... Um, it, it, it is a kind of engagement with a, a true story. Um, this woman in Scotland who, who was murdered at the, at the witch burning times in Scotland in the 17th century, and thousands of people died at that time. It was a traumatic time in Scotland, which still um, uh, casts its effects mm -hmm. through history. And uh, I suppose my piece is a kind of statement of solidarity or, or perhaps a kind of retrospective act of compassion with this wo woman who suffered uh, uh, because of her difference, perhaps, or um, her sex, maybe, or her just a, a certain um, hysteria that was uh, current in the country at, the, at that time. And um, I, I wanted to write a piece which uh, identified with her in that way. And although it doesn't tell her story directly, uh, there is an element of her fantasy uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the... the uh, rather traumatic nature of her life. We've got a view on Lambeth Palace. A friend of yours is living there, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, um, a few years ago, um, I... I and, and a poet friend of mine, Michael Simmons Roberts, wrote a, a piece of music theatre called Parthenogenesis. But we were put together with a, uh, a theologian that I didn't know at that time, but it turned out to be one of the most uh, important theologians in the English-speaking world. Uh, at that time, a, a mere bishop in Wales, <coughs> Rowan Williams. And we worked together, the three of us, on, on the ideas behind the piece. Uh, and it was a marvellous way of working, not just with a poet collaborator, but with a theologian collaborator um, in a scholarly way, in a reflective way, in a discussion, a three-way colloquium, if you like. Uh, there was lots of prayer and reflection, poetry, music, drama. But then, uh, in the years following, of course, Rowan Williams was made Archbishop of Canterbury, which is probably the, the most important, certainly the most important mm -hmm. Protestant church in, in the world. And, uh, and maybe even the most important churchman in this country as well. Um, so we don't really see as much of him now That's on a personal level. That's what I was level. going to ask. Do you still see him? I see him sometimes, yes. um, but y usually... You're close now. You could go yes, over and visit him. Give him a wave. <laughs> When did you, for the first time, get into contact with music? Um, 
The, the most significant thing for me as a child was being given a little recorder at school when I was about eight or nine years old. And uh, I, although it, it, it's something that happens to many children, uh, it's part of the educational process in the UK, may, maybe in other places, um, it, it had a big impact on me in that it made me want to play more instruments. But also, almost from day one, I wanted to write music. Uh, so that um, I didn't know what that meant then, but uh, just the physical uh, experience of picking up an instrument and playing some notes on it uh, triggered something um, that ha has never left me. Uh, I, I, I do trace it back to those very early stages. But my earliest musical memory uh, uh, of something that really had an impact on me is a little, I was a little younger than that, I must have been about five or six, when I was taken to the, the, the Catholic Cathedral in Edinburgh and heard probably for the first time in my life Victoria Palestrina or something like that. I uh, didn't know what it was, but this, it was this beautiful sound allied to something that seemed very significant in a very mysterious way. And that early connection in my mind with uh, uh, really profoundly beautiful music, with the mystery of something sacred that was going on uh, has never left me, and uh, I, I think think back on it as a kind of seminal moment. You were. Uh are not afraid of outing yourself as a Catholic. Isn't that strange in a, a time when most artists are because they are afraid of losing commissions when they say that they are Catholic? Yes, that's a very interesting point and it points to the time, it points to the fact that we are living in difficult times again for Christians. The fact that we that Christians uh, succumb to a fear mm -hmm. about even admitting that they're Christians in the modern world mm -hmm. points to something going wrong in our society. And I certainly have noticed a growing uh, militancy in anti-religious voices. Uh, gone are the days, the heady days of the 1970s when there used to be dialogue between people of faith and people uh, who didn't share the faith. Um, uh, th th those dialogues are closing it down, and that's a great shame. Um, and I'm certainly aware, I mean, we, one talks about a growing fundamentalism in the world anyway, which is true, but there is a fundamentalism in atheism now too. They uh, have become more aggressive. Much more aggressive. And um, For instance? Well, the whole uh, Richard Dawkins thing in this country, I don't know if that has spread to yes. uh, mainland Europe, but... Um, Basically, the, the, the people who support Richard Dawkins and, and others like him um, are, are militant atheists who are trying to expel uh, religion from the public spaces. Richard Dawkins will say it's precisely because of the fundamentalists that we, or you in this case, is, is trying to get out of that, to push religion out of society. Well, the churches themselves have fought against fundamentalism uh, and, and uh, generally do quite a good job of it. If, he's, if, he, if people like him are genuinely interested in fighting religious fundamentalism, they would find willing allies uh, in the mainstream churches. Uh, I don't think that's what his purpose is. It's to destroy all religion. It's to take all religion uh, out of the public sphere mm -hmm. and to caricature it demonize people of religion as fanatics and fundamentalists uh, is a propaganda ploy uh, that the militant atheists are using, sometimes very effectively. How and that's why we live in, yeah. in, in, in mm -hmm. difficult times for people mm -hmm. of faith just now. How do they um, use it very effectively? Um, well, uh, it's the, the, the uh, retreat to a uh, 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 the lowest common denominator descriptions of people of faith, mm -hmm. people with, uh, with blind faith, uh, the, 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 the examples of uh, Christian narrow-mindedness or religious narrow-mindedness we use is always from the same types of people, um, fundamentalists in the United States, um, creationists, uh, creationists 
um, it's a very narrow view of, of the faith, a very mm -hmm. narrow understanding of the traditions of the faith. Um, and, and those fundamentalists in America or elsewhere su suit Richard Dawkins very well. Mm -hmm. um, he can crank up the fear about religion by pinpointing and highlighting uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the nutters um, uh, in, in the world. Uh, but the, the, the fact is, um, the undeniable fact is that uh, most people of, of faith, most people of religious faith are not nutters, uh, that they're... Um, uh, th there are ver there are a wide spectrum of people. Most of them mm -hmm. are very moderate in their political views, uh, at ease with the, the, our mm -hmm. secularism. Secularism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you know, determined I think to maintain uh, a dialogue and and also uh, a necessity for religion to take its place in public debate uh, rather than closing it down, mm -hmm. which is what the fanatics want. You speak of a desacralization of the world c cultivated by these new ruling elites. Mm. Can you give examples? Yes, I mean, w we see uh, um, attempts all the time from uh, the top of the, of the EU right down to people operating in schools of trying to take religion out of the equation, trying to, for example, create a constitution for the, the economic union, the, the, the European Union that has mm. no mention of the, its Christian heritage. Why should they? Uh, because Christianity is, is a huge part of our culture as Europeans. It's more part of our culture than uh, the Mediterranean and, and, and Greek um, uh, antiquity that is, that is uh, uh, being used uh, as a kind of um, paradigmatic example. Mm -hmm. It's very important, but so is it Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, th some people are embarrassed by it, but some people are determined to expunge it from our coll collective cultural memory. And that's a kind, that is a, a vandalistic act. It's a cult of cultural aggression. And mm -hmm. um, uh, these people, uh, that, that attempt, I mm -hmm. would say, amounts to a desacralization of our world, taking not just our historical memory mm -hmm. out of the equation, but taking our very concept of what the, the sacred might mean in our world out of our consciousness. And I think that's criminal. Um, and and it, it affects not just Christians, but people of all faiths and none. To take the idea of the sacred out of our concept of what our world is uh, is a profoundly dangerous thing for the Why? Human, human being. Because I think all human beings throughout history have engaged with a sense of the sacred. As a musician, I know that probably m more than most in that I, I recognize in music a continual historical uh, searching for uh, a sense of the other in our world. H humanity at its best, and I think when humanity at its best is when it's making music, um, um, throws its arms open mm -hmm. to the potential of otherness. It throws its, its arms open to the potential of immateriality, that there is more to our lives uh, than, the, than the sum of our parts. What does sacredness in music mean to you? Well, I think uh, lovers of music, especially lovers of this complex form, which is classical music, um, talk in sometimes in unguarded ways about music being the most spiritual of the arts. And perhaps they mean many, many different things by that. Mm -hmm. But lovers of music, whether they actually are spiritual or not, or whether they're believers or not, will we'll use language that is akin to the language of spirituality. They will use a kind of pseudo-theological language for to, ac to account for uh, the, the, the impact of music mm -hmm. on their lives. They will talk about their lives being transformed by music. They will talk about their lives being changed by music, uh, that music um, throws light on their perspectives or even indeed their relationships uh, with, with other people. 
And uh, if music is as powerful as that, that it transforms the individual, uh, then we are talking about uh, a, a power that is analogous to what Christians would des describe as grace, the power of grace, um, that is the workings of the mind of God uh, in, in its relationship with mm -hmm. humanity and, it, and in its potential to impact on human beings. Um, that's why I think of music as being a... Uh, uh, as having a kind of umbilical link with the sacred, that through music, that music opens windows onto the divine. Here is something, in essence, which is not physical. Um, you can't see music, uh, you can't touch it, you can't consume it, you can't eat it or drink it. Um, but yet, its power reaches deep down into not just our psyches, but into the deep crevices of the soul. Um, it's that immateriality that makes us ask uh, uh, deep questions about not just music, but uh, as to the otherness of things that, that can open our lives up so much um, uh, to um, being touched by powers that are not apparent, uh, either visual or, or in, in a physical way. In that sense, music is a deep mystery in our lives and in our history and our society. Um, uh, and it's one of the great joys of being a human being that it can, uh, it can do these things to mm -hmm. our, our souls and to our hearts and our minds. What's your image of God? I have no image of God. I have, I have a sound of God. Uh, oh, yeah? Because of my composer and um, uh, those, uh, those, I have sounds in my head which I think have something to do with God uh, more than a, uh, more than a picture of a, a thing. <laughs> and what, what are these sounds? Um, Can you they describe? are sounds. It's hard to put them into words. Uh, but I think what I try to do, what every composer does, is try to capture that sonic image in their imagination and bring it to life uh, in their work as composers. Um, I think composers uh, are, are a kind of vessel of the divine, uh, without being too arrogant about it, uh, and I'm talking about swathes of musical history here, uh, because they have that glimpse, which is not a visual glimpse, uh, but a spiritual glimpse through sound an imagined sound, a sound which is in, in essence silence to begin with, or apparent silence, but only exists in the imagination of one's inner ear, one's inner heart. I was wondering whether you take your specific inspiration from, for instance, the cross, like you did in the Seven Last Words, or the Advent song, Veni, Veni, Emmanuel, or uh, uh, Christus Vincit, or, or mm -hmm. is there something specific? Well, I suppose uh, because of the person I am, uh, uh, I do look back into the traditions that shaped me for specific yes. uh, inspiration. I look to scripture, perhaps, or to liturgy, even, um, to Gregorian chant, um, uh, to the great hymn tradition uh, in, 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 in the Christian churches, Veni Veni Emmanuel, of course, in Advent. But I think um, theology and liturgy gives me so much, and uh, rather obsessively, I seem to be going around these three days <laughs> yes, yes. before Easter. Why? Um, I don't know. I can't really account for that, except that if one mm. sees the resurrection as being the central uh, important historical event in human history, yes. one can't really understand uh, or engage with the resurrection without what happened before it. What do you experience in these days before Easter? Is it something personal or, um, or not? Um, it, it is, but, but it's also something that uh, culturally we know deep in our bones what, what, it, what it is. Um, we know what the sepulchre means. Um, uh, we confront death 
as human beings all the time, uh, but also in confronting death, we're asking profound questions about the meaning of life. I suppose that's what artists uh, do in many different ways. My way into asking those questions is to confront uh, the, the emptiness of the tomb, uh, the darkness of the tomb, the confrontation with death, and, um, and the promise of life after death, whatever that means. Uh, in what way do you see that? Do you believe in that? Uh, yes, I think I do, um, because I feel uh, drawn to reflect on it, even though it is a mystery. Uh, I haven't rejected it outright, as so many people have, as a fairy tale. In fact, Messiel uh, said that uh, the Catholic faith is one great fairy tale, with one essential difference from all other fairy tales. It's true, and uh, there's great wor words of wisdom in, in, in that, and um, I think I understand what he, he means. It's, there's, there's a great delight in fairy tales. Um, it appeals to the, the, they appeal to the child in us, and if a composer can't keep the child in him alive in his adult years, he wouldn't be a composer. It's the same with any artist, and I think, to be honest, any sentient being, if you can't keep your child alive, especially a person of faith, uh, something essential about you dies. I was uh, impressed by the story of the famous cellist Rostropovich playing the cello in Moscow. Now you have got first-hand uh, uh, experience mm. of that because he told you, you, yes. you were friends with him. Yes, I became a friend late, later in his life. Uh, yeah. He gave the uh, American premiere, or he conducted the American mm. premiere of my percussion concerto, mm -hmm. Veni Veni Emmanuel in Washington in 1993 or 94. And I went over for it and uh, was astounded that I, mean, I expected him to be distant and aloof because he's this great um, uh, hero figure in, in the world of music. But he, was, he wasn't like that at all. It, 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 when I first met him, he embraced me and he behaved as if he had always known me. And he invited uh, Evelyn Glennie, the percussionist, and myself to his apartment mm -hmm. in Washington and he talked about his life and it was an amazing evening just hearing not just about the musicians he knew, uh, Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Benjamin Britten uh, and many others, but the, the historical figures that he knew. He had stood in the presence of Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev. But he told this amazing story of the time when um, in the early days of Perestroika and Glasnost the new democracy was under attack from the old regime and there was an attempted coup in 1991 and it looked for a time that the whole uh, thirst for democracy was going to die uh, as the old communists were going to take over again. And he uh, was in Paris at the time and he said to his wife that he was going down the street for some cigarettes and uh, because he, he, he knew that he, he wouldn't, she wouldn't have accepted what he really wanted to do which is what he did, which was to go straight to the airport and fly to Moscow um, with his cello. And he uh, uh, managed to blag his way through the airport and went straight to the Moscow White House, which was being under attack. It was under attack from tanks at the time, and Yeltsin was there. And he managed to get into the White House and uh, to give sustenance and encouragement to them. Of course, everyone knew who he was and he was given an armed guard. And while the, the communists were bombing, uh, were, at, were attacking the White House with, uh, with tanks, he, uh, uh, was, uh, he, he, took a, he had a photograph taken of himself and his armed guard who had fallen asleep on his shoulder and, he was, and Rostropovich was holding his, the, his guard's Kalashnikov in his arms. Um, knowing that they could be minutes away from uh, being uh, invaded uh, 
It was a, an astonishing photograph to see that, to, a personal photograph. But of course, um, it was the arrival of this great musician who brought the gift of music, uh, uh, which encouraged those people, I believe, uh, to take uh, their revolution for democracy uh, that bit further and to hold out against uh, the evil men who sought to destroy them. So because he was playing the cello there at that crucial moment, soldiers would hear and maybe would be would refrain, maybe That's refrain. That's exactly what happened uh, and there are um, accounts of people who were there that the men outside, the men in the tanks and with the, the guns heard Rostropovich playing the cello mm -hmm. in the ruins of this uh, building and it discouraged them, dissuaded them uh, to obey the orders to attack. turbulence, this, this violence, this conflict is indeed a characteristic trait of your music too. I think so, mm -hmm. yes. It's, it's been there in, in much that I've written, mm -hmm. um, especially in the, the, the music for the concert hall and the music for the, the, the theatre, operas and so on. It, to me, uh, storytelling, and in mm -hmm. a sense opera, has mm -hmm. for me, has to be a storytelling. It has to have uh, not just resolution, but a conflict that needs to be resolved. So mm -hmm. there has to be scope for uh, turbulence and uh, um, conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and I suppose there's an analogy in, in orchestral music as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. When it comes to music for liturgy though, uh, yes, there is some turbulence there, but there's, there's um, if, if the music is being particularly and specifically written for liturgy, you have to leave some of your ego at the door and remember that you're you're making music which is to be a vehicle for other people mm -hmm. praying and encountering the divine. How would you describe your world view? I'm shaped by many things. I, I, I'm shaped by my time. I'm shaped by the politics of my time. But I, I think the the core. Uh, of that is a, a, a deep resonance uh, in, in a Judeo-Christian view of the world and of, uh, and of humanity. Uh, I make no apologies of being heir to that. Um, it, it colours my view of the world and it makes me think that the world is a good place. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Mr. Irwin, for the view of you. Thank you.